G'day and welcome to 4550 RPM, Remembering Past Musos. In this episode, we'll be discussing Southern Rockers Molly Hatchet with former road manager Keith Jughead Johnson, also known as Jug. Now, in this conversation, we'll be concentrating mostly on the years 1978 to 1987, which was Jug's main time with the band. We will talk about Molly Hatcher's rise to fame, the first few albums, and the original band members, all who have since passed, sadly. Jug gives us a few behind-the-scenes glimpses of life on the road with Molly Hatchet, which includes some hilarious stories, as well as some more solemn moments. So strap yourself in, get set, as we now go to my discussion with Keith Jughead Johnson. Well, hello and welcome to the show. I'm your host, GK, and I'm both pleased and honoured to have on the show today, Keith Jughead Johnson, former road manager for Molly Hatchet. Uh, now, uh, Jug and I have had a previous chat, and we got to know one another a little bit a few days ago, and um, we, we got on really well, and I hope this time we're going to get on just as well, because I've hit record this time, and I hope it goes just as smoothly. So without further ado, let me bring on Keith. Keith, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Garth, and good morning, Tasmania. Ah, great. Thank you. And good evening, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I like that. Um, so, listen, um, you know, we've had a little bit of a chat, and I know a little bit about you, but if you wouldn't mind telling my audience um, a little bit about yourself. Now, you were the road manager for Molly Hatchet, um, and so just tell us about that yourself and your involvement with them. No problem. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to back up a little bit and how I got involved into the music business. Okay. Okay. Yeah, good. In in 1964, when I was 11 years old, my father was doing a project for the owner of WAPE radio station in Jacksonville, Florida. And he asked my father if he wanted to have tickets to see the Beatles in Jacksonville at the Gator Bowl in September of 1964. And my stepfather took myself, my sister, and we saw the Beatles. And what really hit me was the way the people acted during, before, and after the show. And at the end of the show, I'm just looking around at, you know, there wasn't much production back in 1964 uh, like it is today and 40 years ago. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I got this feeling over me. It's like, uh, God, this is pretty cool. I'd like to do this for a living and uh, uh, step up a few years to 1972. And I was going to school at uh, in Gainesville, Florida, going to college. And uh, I started uh, doing uh, pr- production promotion for uh, different promoters in the southeast. I've worked for uh, Jet Set Enterprises. Uh, I worked for uh, Beach Club, Cellar Door, Concerts West. And uh, I would do the production of the concert, uh, taking care of the backstage, how many stage hands you need, you know, taking care of catering, just the basics that you need when you receive a rider contract. And shoot on up to 1977, uh, I got a call from uh, a gentleman by the name of Butch Trucks, who is the drummer for the Allman Brothers Band, or was the drummer for the Allman Brothers Band. And uh, he he was on hiatus from the Allman Brothers, and uh, he asked me if I wanted to go out with his new band called Trucks. And I said, sure. So I was his road manager for about uh, nine months, and uh, that ended, of course, we all got the news in 1977 uh, that Leonard Skinner's plane had gone down and uh, everybody in the, in the Southern music world was so devastated by that. And uh, uh, and it just so happens that uh, later that year, Molly Hatchett was signed to a contract with Epic Records. And I went in for an interview with uh, uh, Pat Armstrong, the band's manager, and uh, I, it was between me and another person, and uh, I got the job, and I was with Molly Hatcher from 1978 to 1987 during the band's most successful world tours. Okay. Um, just before we go on, just in case people don't understand, what does a road manager do, Jug? What, what were your duties? What do you have to do? 
Well, first thing you do is before you even go out on tour, uh, you, you have a contract writer that gives specifications of what is required. Yeah, uh, what is required, our needs are, as far as stage hands, uh, electrical needs that we need, catering, uh, and we have to advance these shows in advance. So when we walk in, I meet with the promoter's rep. We go over and make sure everything's taken care of. You know, there's a rigging call at 6 o'clock in the morning. Then there's a crew call at 7 o'clock in the morning. And uh, breakfast is provided by the promoter. And uh, you go through your day, and uh, the, uh, the sound goes up, the lights go up, and uh, you do sound check at uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. You have crew meal. And, uh, the band either goes back to the hotel or stays, uh, at the venue. And, uh, lo and behold, you got a rock show. Just jumping ahead a bit at myself, really. Um, how big were some of the shows that Molly Hatchett put on? What are we talking about? What size audience and auditoriums and things like that? We have played to over 100,000 people to all the way down to, uh, Presidium halls like are 2,000, 2,500 people, but you know, there are multiple shows in the smaller events, uh, in the venues. And, uh, but most of all, when, uh, uh, the album Flirting with Disaster came out, which was Molly Hatchett's number one album, uh, it, it just started growing and growing and growing. And, uh, you know, you, when you first go out and, and do, you know, start out as an opening act, you know, you're on a tour bus, you got crew members, you got a, a, a vehicle carrying all your equipment. And then when you start headlining, you've got four to five semis out on the road. And then you've got three to four tour buses out on the road for the light crew, the sound crew, Molly Hatch's band crew, the band itself and myself. We had uh, our own bus, uh, we, which we got 1979. And, uh, it was uh it it was an eight bunk bus and uh most buses are twelve. This bus was made uh for Molly Hatchet itself. It had the first album on one side of the bus, it had uh the second album on the other side of the bus, and those first two albums was Molly Hatchet, Molly Hatchet, and the second one was Molly Hatchet's Flirting with Disaster. Have you got any photos of that bus? Uh yes. Okay. Yes. I'd love I'll, to see him because I I'll, 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 I'll forward them to you. I love seeing things like that. Okay, so let, let's start at the start then, because um, I did jump ahead there, but I just thought it was um, relevant. Um, so with the first album, um, how did they how did they get that deal? Because um, I, you know, I'm, I'm champing at the bit to jump ahead to flirt with disaster. But with that first album, how did the guys come together? Um, how did that all happen? Just just briefly. Uh, introduce us to the band um, and the guys that got together like that first six 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 fellas all right great uh, 1971 Dave Lubeck and Steve Holland started Molly Hatchet okay uh, as the years came to fruition um, uh, Banner Thomas was added along with Bruce Crump then you, you've got uh, uh, Steve Holland uh, not, excuse me I'm sorry not Steve Holland but uh, Dwayne Rowland and uh, uh, the uh, the final member who joined was Danny Joe Brown. So you got six members of Molly Hatchet. Right. And and as we know, and we're going to talk about that a bit now, that the, all the six originals are now deceased, which is part of the reason that we're here talking about this. That's correct. And the only people that are left are members of the crew. And with me being uh, the road manager of the band, I've had... People contact me wanting to know about the history of Molly Hatchet uh, during those uh, uh, first nine years, because during those first nine years is when Molly Hatchet really, you know, struck gold and platinum. And, right. you know, right. it, it just uh, it, it went on from there. Um, it was amazing. Yeah. Well, um, again, yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know, I'll go into it. I mean, my day starts out at at uh, 5.30 in the morning, okay? <clears throat> We're coming in from probably three or 400 miles away into the next venue for the next day. We get there about 5.30 in the morning, okay? I'm woken up about 25 miles outside of town so I can wash my face and 
get together, you know, and at least have some sense of what's going on. And uh, we would go, the band would go directly to the hotel. And I would check the band in. I'd go to the front desk where I'd already called the uh, uh, manager of the hotel, gave him a rooming list. We had the rooming list and room keys and envelopes with the band members' names on each uh, envelope. I went back to the bus, put it in each band member's bunk. If they wanted to get up and go to the rooms, they got up and went to the rooms. I got, you know, I just put their keys in their bunks. I went and locked the door to the bus. I went back in and started my day, and I went right to the uh, to the venue to make sure that the uh, the uh, writer contract is being adhered to. Right. Yeah. Look, I've been. I, my, my brother was a promoter, um, and I, I've seen a little bit of um, the promoter side of things. And I, like, I mean, I saw some of the writers in the contracts, and you know, quite often for fe- female artists, it was flowers, right? Um, and what sort of things might have been on Molly Hatchett's writer, like things that people wouldn't know, people wouldn't think of? Well, you know, so it, it, it got more impressive, I guess you yeah. would say, during the years. You know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, back in the early year, uh, 1978, you know, you would have Coca-Cola or, you know, you would have, you know, bottles of water. Uh, of course, there would be different types of alcohol uh, for the band to relax and whatever they wanted to do. And, uh, you know, and, and as it got bigger, I mean, you had more deli trays, you had pizzas, you know, you had sometimes dinners delivered after the meal because Danny Joe Brown was a diabetic and he couldn't eat before the meal because he didn't want to feel so bloated. Oh, so you mean he didn't eat before the show? No, he would eat after the show. Okay, yeah, okay, right. Because he, you know, he he liked going out there and and you know going across that stage, oh, yeah. left to right, front oh, yeah. and back. You know, making those kicks in the air. Yeah. You know, okay. and uh, you know, I mean, Danny put on a show. He connected to the people. If you don't connect to the people, you don't sell albums. Yeah, and a good front man, and you need a good front man in any band if you're going to go somewhere. Danny was a good front man. Oh, um, absolutely. Um, so let's let's get to talking about flirting with disaster because, um, as I've told you, that had, that album had a big impact on me and some of my friends. And um, my one of my bandmates actually has that image that's over your shoulder of that album tattooed full size on his back. <laughs> I can't imagine the pain the guy went through. <laughs> I don't like needles, okay, but. I mean, he must be one tough dude. Yeah, t- tough dude. You got it. You know, it did. It did happen over a number of weeks or months, as far as I know, because it's quite detailed. But uh, that's how much we sort of, um, uh, well, he did especially love this album and love this band. But I- I've got a crazy question for you. You know, when they were putting this album together. They couldn't have known what it was going to be, did they? Did they know that this was going to be something special? Flirting no. with Disaster album. No. Um, what was one thing that we had an advantage of, okay, is the producer for the uh, first five albums was a gentleman by the name of Tom Orman. And he's got uh, a book out now called Turn It Up. And he talks about all the musical groups that he's worked with, Kiss, Ted Nugent, Cheap Trick, Molly Hatchet, you know, Motley Crue, you name it, he's done it, you know. And... Uh, uh, the producer really made the sound of Molly Hatchet bigger than life. And with the first album, people all over the world, okay, uh, including Europe, we never got down to Australia. We never get, got over into Japan or, it, you know, any of those areas. But uh, the, the album just took off and um, because there was such a void there in the music of Southern rock with the, you know, the, uh, the gentleman from Leonard Skinner passing away when their plane went down in 1977 in, in, uh, and, um, it, it just, uh, I don't know. It just, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And I don't think anybody it really expected, at least I didn't, um, mm-hmm. the band to do so well with the first album with the second album, I mean, the second album was shipped platinum, 
Okay, what shipped gold? It was shipped platinum. Okay, well, the, what that means is that's a million copies sent out to all the record stores throughout the United States. And yes, it was vital back then. We didn't have, you know, computers like this or you know, handheld devices. And uh, it, you know, it, it, you know, and, and for me, you know, being the road manager, you know, we didn't have cell phones like this. You, you know, we had pay phones. You know, I mean. <laughs> My cell phone was a quarter and going to the pay phone and dropping the quarter in and making a phone call. We didn't have uh, email. My email was Federal Express. You know, and it's the a, way it's a totally different era. Um, oh, totally, totally, totally different. Um, so, you know, um, I'm going to use these images that I'm looking at now. Over your shoulder, that record there, is that the double platinum? Yes, it's a double platinum album by Molly Hatchet. Right, okay, that's the one. A disaster. Yeah, right, because that's what and, we're talking And since I got this, okay, 45 years, 43 years ago, okay, that uh, it's gone, it's sold more albums. It's probably sold close to four or five million albums. Right, and um, some of those were definitely ours down here, I can tell you now. Um, so, you know, with the Flirt and Disaster, Flirt and With Disaster album, it's one of those albums where I, and, and there are a few around, but it's one of those albums I say there isn't one bad track on it. Um, the title track, Flirting with a Disaster, is just something else. Like, you're never going to hear anything like that again. Just my opinion. But um, I, I, that Boogie No More with that is great, you know. Uh, That's one of my favourite songs. It's one of my favourite songs. And what they did is they, um, you know, they would close with Boogie No More. OK, I mean, that would be their encore sh- song. And uh, if nobody's ever seen Molly Hatchet, OK, the guys, Dave Lubeck, Dwayne Roland, you've got uh, Banner Thomas on bass and Steve Holland. The band came up to center stage with the spotlights on them. And it's like they would go back and forth with their guitars. <laughs> you know, and, and then. The choreography, most Southern bands did not have choreography, okay? Molly Hatchet had choreography to where it got the people involved, involved. in the music. Yes, absolutely, yeah. But, yeah, like, yeah, I'm glad to hear you say, like, the Boogie No More. It's one of my favorite songs. Um, but there's not a bad one on there. And even, you know, they do the, um, that, the cover, It's All Over Now. What a great cover. I mean, I, I was in a covers band, so I, I appreciate covers. And um, their version, and it's a it's a Bobby Womack song. Am I right there? Most of the songs, okay. And I hope I'm answering your question, okay. Uh, I mean, we're halfway around the world, so um, most of the songs were written on the tour bus. Like, for example, "Flirting with Disaster," okay. That was written on the tour bus after the tours ended. Um, we started in, I'm going to use the first tour as an example, okay? 1978, we started in September with REO Speedwagon, and we opened for REO Speedwagon, and that tour went through 1978 into 1979 until May, and I myself did not see home for nine months. And, um, you know, when the band is on the bus, Sometimes at night, sometimes when you've got an overnight trip or a day trip to get to the next venue, if it's like six, seven hundred miles away, um, they're on on the bus writing music because what they do is they write the music. They go into the studio after about two weeks of being off, go in the studio, record the new album. And it, you know, and, and what happened on the first album is Molly Hatchet went to uh, to Europe in uh, 1979, August of 1979, they played the Reading Festival. They played uh, the Nuremberg Festival, you know, and groups that were on that were like Alvin Lee and 10 years after, you know, not 10 years later, but 10 years after. And, and then, you know, the uh, you know in Germany, we played with the Who, and there was over 100,000 people there in the in the, in the Zeppelin fell where Hitler would, was going to encompass all of the, uh, all the, you know, emperors of countries and presidents and, you know, in and around this massive coliseum and, uh, open air coliseum. And, uh, it you know, when you're out playing in front of 
hundred thousand people. It's, I mean, the goosebumps you get is just incredible. I don't think any of us knew at the time that Molly had to whatever, you know, was going to be at the level that they were in after two albums. Yeah, well, that's that's right. But like I said, you know, I, I started out this question about Fleetwood Disaster. They 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 can't have known. I mean, who could know? They, you didn't have a crystal ball that said, wow, this is going to be great. Um, but coming up next after that, um, if, if I'm co- not incorrect, the next album... Beating the Odds. Beating the Odds. And Danny, and before we talk about that, sorry, Garth, before we talk about that, Danny of Joe made a decision, okay? It all start, it's all started like in January, February of 1979 that Danny Joe, A, he was, yes, he had some problems with his diabetes, but Danny wanted to basically, since he was the front man for the band, he wanted to basically be the guy. Okay, you know, he would do he would do all the interviews and things like that, you know, and when the band first went into this, it was six guys. You know, it's not just one person. And uh, Danny decided that uh, uh, it it would be in his best interest that he would leave. And he left. His last show was in April of 1980. And he left and uh, uh, we got Jimmy Farrar in and. uh Jimmy did, you know, one heck of a job. I mean, yeah, he yeah. had big, big shoes to fill. Yeah, Jimmy you know. Farrar joined on the third album, Beating the Odds. How, how did how did you find him? Where did he come from? Like, how did he end up joining the band? Where did they get him from? Um, just tell our, my listeners. It, it, it just so help, happens, Garth, that uh, an old crew member by the name of Rocky Membretti, okay, was in Daytona Beach, Florida. And there was a band down there playing, and Jimmy was singing. Well, Rocky had gotten the uh, the news through the grapevine that Danny was looking to leave, and so he called Pat Armstrong, the band's manager, and said, "I want you know, there's this guy down here. I think you need to listen to him." And uh, Jimmy did a promo tape, sent it to Pat Armstrong. Pat Armstrong sent it to Tom Orman, producer of the first few Molly Hatchet albums, and. The thumbs up were given, and we rehearsed uh, for the uh, month of uh, April. Later, you know, after Danny left, that was our last show. So we rehearsed uh, in 1979 with um, Jimmy Farrar, and uh, we went out on the road uh, in May of 1980 with Jimmy. And the first show he played was to 20,000 people in Virginia, Kings Dominion. You know, talking about jumping from a you know, a bar a guy who plays in bars to, to headlining, you know, 20,000 people. Those are big shoes to fill. And, you you know, you you got to be a big boy to be able to handle that, you know. I yeah, mean, absolutely. Now, we've got to, you know, we said it before, you know, uh, Danny Joe was a fantastic front man. And you, you said it a couple yeah. of times, big uh, shoes to fill. Uh, and absolutely. Do you think that album, you know, this is just my personal thoughts. Do you think that album, um, Beating the Odds, was a little bit of a di- different direction than the first two, slightly? It had to be, because you had a new guy on board. had to be. A little bit, a little bit because of the uh, range that Jimmy could do with his voice, okay? And um, just to let you know, that, that album itself, Beating the Odds, that went gold. It went platinum. So, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, it just seems like the first five albums that Molly Hatchett did were just boom, boom, boom. And then after the fifth album, um, they brought in a new producer and uh, the chain, the, the sound of the music really changed. And um, uh, it uh, with the change of the music, the music industry, you know, was changing anyway in, in the way music was. It wasn't more southern rock like it was in the 70s and early 80s. You know, you, you know, we got to the point to where you're hearing Motley Cruz and Aerosmith, you know, and like that so the whole genre of southern rock was kind of being pushed to the side and um but uh you know the band held their own i was with them till 87 and uh uh, i just uh you know it was a great run i mean my parents wanted me to be a doctor well (laughs) guess guess what it didn't you work know, out. You know, guy who's in the rock and roll business, so, you know, it's fun, so, you know. Yes. 
Um, okay, um, uh, so I just wanted to go through the next two albums because I want to get back to, you know, where Danny J comes back in. So, um, you know, the next one is um, Take No Prisoners. Um, right. Now, I've read, this is just not coming from me, I've read that a lot of people say that this is also a very different album, you know, um, than the first two. Um, so this is not just my opinion. I, I've read some others, but hey, I notice on here they do a, a, you know, they do a little Richard cover, you know, Long Tall Sally, which is an old standard that a lot of bands used to do. But um, what, what do you reckon about this album? It's still got the, the original five other guys, but you got Jimmy Farrar up front again. And well, what the direction, the, uh, Tom Horman, the producer, was kind of, you know, guiding the band is with different sound of t- the the sound of that year's music and what was going on, you know, into the future. And um, with that being said, um, Jimmy came in and, uh, you know, did it once again, filled big shoes and did one hell of a job. But yes, the whole sound of Molly Hatchet was changing and um, it, it was more, it was pushing more towards uh, A&M, they, you know, A&M radio. You know, because they wanted, you know, they wanted top 40 hits or top 45 hits, you know, and or the top 100, you know, and, you know, the whole genre of the sound of Molly Hatchet changed. And, you know, the band had to change with the, you know, the changing of the sound. And um, with that being said, uh, Danny did a solo album when he had left the band and uh, he came back. Uh, in 1983, and uh, he comes back in for No Guts, No Glory. I love the album cover. No Guts, Lo- No Glory. Brilliant album cover. I'll throw it up here so people can see it. I love. I just love that album cover. Well, it, it, you know, the, the uh, front of the album cover it depicts, you know, you know these cowboys. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You know, and there was. Where that picture was taken, there was a place in Ocala, Florida, called Six Gun Territory. Okay, it was right down the street from Silver Springs. Uh, uh, I don't know if you folks over in uh, Australia have ever heard of that before, but you know, Google it, pull it up, see what it's about. You know, we're talking about it. So, uh, Six Gun Territory had basically gone out of business, and there was an old town, western town. It was b- built in Ocala, Florida, and we took some of the promo pictures, you know, there. And, uh, you, you know, you, you start off, you know, on one side, you have the new drummer, Barry Borden, you know, and then you come across, you know, and, uh, um, we also have a new, uh, bass player by the name of Riff West who took Banner's place after Banner quit the band, uh, after we played with the Rolling Stones in, uh, I think it was 1980 or 1981 for at Thanksgiving. Uh, we play, we were up there and, uh, we had two nights with them in, uh, in Syracuse, New York at the Carrier Dome. And, uh, one of the songs that Molly Hatchett did was, uh, they did a remake of the song All Over Now. Yeah. That the Stones yeah. wrote. It's okay. great. Yeah. And they, the Stones saw it on the, uh, the crew of the Stones saw the, the song on the set list. Well, crew tells management, management tells band, the Rolling Stones, the biggest, you know, rock and roll band in the, in the, in the world. And, uh, you know, they came back and said, you cannot play that song. Well, there was a member of Molly Hatchet, um, uh, that, uh, and th- this was back when Jimmy was with the band. So it had to be in 80 or it had to be in uh, 81. Uh, there was a member of, of the band. I'm not going to say who it was, but uh, he decided that uh, he felt like the band needed to play oh, all over now in their set list. Well, the band played it. Um, the Stones were not real happy. Um, and uh, th- we were thrown off the second show. And Dave Lubeck and Banner Thomas got into a ferocious verbal fight uh, after the show. Uh, there were a lot of f bombs flying, uh, you know, boop, you and boop, boop, you and your wife's up. Boop, you know, <laughs> you yes. know it, it's, yes, yes. it's just uh, 
you know, it got nasty. And on, we had a charter plane to go up there because all the airlines, it was Thanksgiving and all the planes, you know, airlines were sold out. We chartered a plane to fly up to Syracuse. And uh, on the way back, nobody, nobody said a word. Nobody said a word because of the argument of Dave and Banner. And uh, all of a sudden, Banner gets up and he says, I'm leaving Molly Hatchet. And at that time, the band and crew all stood up on the plane and started clapping. Oh, okay. Okay. You know, yeah. and uh, so Banner leaves. Um, Riff West comes in. Uh, he played with a group by the name, I believe, White Witch, uh, and uh, did a great job. Uh, he and I were got to be really, really close friends. It just seems like the new guys that come in, you know, that come in, you know, like Jimmy and I were really close friends, you know, he didn't really know anybody in the band. And I was his contact before he even, you know, came in the band, right. you know, and the same thing with Riff. And I must point out that both these guys have passed away as well. Um, oh, oh, they're they're all gone. They're all gone. You know, of the original members of Molly Hatch up to 1990. They're all gone. They're all gone. Sadly. They're all gone. And, God, I want to say something to you, yeah. my friend. Uh, there's not a day that I get up, not a day that I don't think about those guys, those eight guys, you know, all of them, you know, and it's just, you know, in, in fact, I'm going to, you know, uh, I'll tell you something a little bit later, but, uh, so. Yeah, look, these are, this is the, you know, I said it before that, you know, these are things that we're all facing now as we're getting older. All our old compatriots, are, they're all passing away, mate, you know, and it's, it's something that we just have to get used to. Unfortunately, most of the guys at Molly Hatchet, okay, they died in their 50s. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, just, just quickly, I'll just, I'll just list a couple, uh, and then you can correct me if I'm wrong, but, um, Dave flew back, um, he died in 2017 at age 66. Steve Holland um, in 2020, age 66. Dwayne Rowland in 2006, age 53. Danny Joe Brown, 2005, age 53. Banner Thomas uh, in 2017 at 62. And Bruce Crump at 57. Sorry, I don't have uh, Farrar, Jimmy Farrar and um, uh, Riff West there, but... Um, uh. But they're Riff all, all too young. All so uh, young. Yeah. Riff died in November uh, 19th of uh, 2014. Okay. And Jimmy Farrar died uh, October the 29th in 2018. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, yes, they all went too early. Does, does rock and roll have, a, you know, does it, you know, is it hard? Of course it's hard. You know, you get, you're away from your family. And what happens when you're on the road cooped up in a tour bus, these guys become your family. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And you learn to count on them and they learn to count on you. And, uh, it, you know, I can't, you know, name how many times or, you know, talk about how many times, you know, that I knew what these guys needed before they even knew it. That, that was part of my job, knowing what's going on, you know, before it even happens. And, uh, Especially when uh, Hatchet, you know, after Fortinwood disaster uh, came to fruition, uh, everything just got bigger than life, and uh, and uh, it was just it was an incredible ride that I had. Oh yeah, you had a good. Yeah, you've you've been really blessed there um, uh, to be associated and being a part of that. That's fantastic, and you know. Um, the, the tiny bit that I did in the covers band that I was in, uh, you know, and it's got it's nothing compared to this, but I completely understand what you're saying there because we were more more like a small family as well. Like we moved into state, all of us just, you know, we moved into state to do something different and to start a, in, in a new direction. And um, so we had to rely on each other. We had no one else. Um, and, uh, so I know, I know how that is and you, you, you know, you are like family and, um, uh, it's very sad when, you know, I keep saying it's sad when these guys, um, you know, they start passing away. I, I wanted to ask you something that, um, I think I know the answer to, but probably people are asking that don't know. What is the meaning behind the band's name? What is the real truth behind the name of the band Molly Hatchet? Well, Garth, if I tell you, I'll have to kill you. Okay? 
<laughs> and let me tell you, buddy, that'll be a long airline flight. Okay, so uh, okay. no, uh, how they got it was the the name of this individual. It was a woman back during the 16th century. Okay. And uh, her name was Hatchet Molly. That was her nickname. And what she did was if a lover did not satisfy her, she would cut their heads off. Wow. That's, that's, that's pretty crazy. So, so, so what the band did was they took Hatchet Molly and they turned it around to yeah. Molly Hatchet. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, I like it. Um, you know, another thing, if you don't mind, if we can talk about this one, um, now that we're talking about the band, you remember I was telling you uh, the band I was in, we lived in a you know small country town outside the city, and one day just all of them just got up one day and said, we're going to the city to get tattoos. Tattoos, right? And Because um, that was Aussieism there, tattoos, but tattoo, tattoos. And um, I said, I, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not going, I don't want any tattoos, you know, and I was the only one that didn't get any. But you had a bit of a story about you know, the uh, sushi bar and the tattoos. You want to share that one with us? No problem. Uh, <laughs> we, we were in uh, Los Angeles and uh, we were staying at the Hyatt on Sunset Strip. Uh, this is after the first album. We might have even been out there uh, finishing up uh, flirting with disaster. Well, the band decides they want to go across the street. There's a sushi place, a restaurant across the street from the uh Hyatt House, and uh, so we went over there, and, uh, you know, the sake started flowing, and people were eating sushi, and I'd never eaten sushi before in my life, you know, I mean, I've eaten fried fish, okay, but as far as eating raw fish, you know, that was a whole new expedition for me. Yeah, I, and, I've, I've never tried it, I've never done it, I just can't bring myself to do it. <laughs> Well, I have eaten it. It's not that bad. I mean, if you don't have fire or something, you know, I guess if you want to survive, you can do that, you know. But uh, but what happened was the uh, sake started to flow and and people were getting, a, you know, a, a little buzz on. And uh, there just happened to be a tattoo store right next to the uh, sushi restaurant. And uh, and some of the band members, you know, said, oh, let's go. Let's go get a tattoo. And Dwayne got a tattoo of uh, uh, Molly, Hat the uh, axe of Molly Hatchet, uh, and also a uh, rebel flag on, on one arm. And uh, you know, come on, Jug, get a tattoo. And I said, No way, you're not sticking me with any needles or anything like that. You know, I, uh, you know, I like this body the way it is. And uh, I, I believe me, I mean, I, I, I'm not a very pretty face, you know, now. But you should have seen me 45 years ago. I mean, I was skinny. I weighed about 135 pounds out on the road. And, uh, you know, being in a position that I had, I had to, with my size being thin, I had to be bigger than life. And uh, I got kind of the reputation from some promoters of being an asshole out on the road. Well, sometimes... <laughs> Sometimes you have to do that, sure, you know, in order sure. to get things done. Yeah. For example, we were playing in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Promoter had spelled Molly Hatchet wrong up on the marquee. Oh. Well, in the contract, it so states that if you spell Molly Hatchet and the word Hatchet with two T's, you would be fined $1,000. And if you did not pay, the band would not play. Wow. And uh, one night... Uh, or one day we came in, we went by the venue, Bruce Crump took a picture of the, uh, of the, uh, two keys on the marquee. I went to the promoter and said, uh, well, you've broken our contract. I'm going to need to get a thousand dollars from, it. you know, and he opens his briefcase and, you know, there's a, a gun in there. You know, I guess he was trying to, you know, scare me or, you know, or whatever, but, uh, you know, I, I just got on the phone to Bill Elson from ATI, American Talent International in New York, and said, Bill, you know, this guy doesn't want to pay the fine. Band doesn't want to play unless he pays the fine. Fifteen minutes before Molly Hatchett went went on at a sold-out show, the guy gave me $1,000 for the and, – and what I was going to do is go out on to the front center stage mic because that – you know, I introduced, you know, Molly Hatchett – at least 2,680 times when I was out with Molly Hatchett over the nine years. And, you know, I, w I was going to go out to the people and explain to them, you know, what the promoter did. 
And if you have a sold out show and people have spent their money, they want to see a rock show. Okay. If, if they don't see that rock show, there's going to be all hell to pay. You know, they would, I don't know if you've ever heard of riots, you know, and concerts and things like that, but it happens, you know, it happens. So, uh, it, you know, and the guy paid it, you know, 15 minutes before we, uh, we want, you know, on stage and, uh, we had a great show and, uh, or, you know, with the, uh, promoter, you know, again. So, you know, it's just, you know, you lose, you learn to your ins and outs and what you can do. And, uh, yeah, you know, um, since you brought that topic up, I think I told you once before, um, the, the last gig my band ever played was shut down, right? We got shut down by the, uh, the police. And, um, it was, uh, we got a warning and, cause it was for in, inciting, inciting riotous behavior. And so they came once and said, any more of that, we're coming back to unplug ya. And, um, uh, they came back and they unplugged us. So, you know, that's sort of pretty rough and ready. It's not as, we weren't as bad as it sounds. It just happened to happen on the last gig. But my question is, you know, a lot of the, um, Southern rock, uh, themes, uh, in Molly Hatch and other Southern rock bands is, you know, hard rock and hard drink and hard living. How, how true and hard fighting, right? Um, and rough and tumble. How, how true is that? How, how realistic is all of that? Yeah, did they did they kick ass out on the road? You yeah. know, between themselves yeah. and other people, absolutely. You know, I mean, a lot of it happened before I was with the band. Okay, in 1978, because you know we're a, a representative of the music, the music that uh, C- Epic Records. We're their, you know, um, representatives, ambassadors. Okay, okay? yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and with being an ambassador, you know, to Thousands and thousands of music ven- venues, you know, from Alaska, Hawaii to Europe, okay, because those were the only places that we went. You know, to, I went to Jamaica, Puerto Rico, down in the islands, things like that. But, you know, we, we never veered that, that far to the west that we call, you know, into uh, Japan or, you know, down to Australia, you know, and it's just sad because I love to see Australia or New yeah. Zealand. Yeah. Yeah. And, because I just hear beautiful what I see, you know, in pictures is incredible. But uh, but it just uh, yeah yeah Hatchet was good friends with Skinner, vice versa, you, you know. And you know when you're out on the road with these organizations, you know, Ario Speedwagon for three months, or you know, you play with Bo- the great Bob Seger and the Silver Bullet oh, Band, yeah. okay. Oh, yeah. And then you know, one great package that we had was with uh, the Outlaws from Tampa, Florida. And, you know, you got the, you know, the outlaws from Tampa. You got, uh, Molly Hatchet from Jacksonville, Florida. It just, you know, we sold out more tours and, uh, or more venues and travel more miles than any other rock and roll band in 1979, 80, and 81. Wow. In other words, you would travel 500 miles a night. Yeah. Set up a show, tear it down, go another three or 400 miles away. Yeah. So you're busy. You're a busy boy back in those days, Jack. <laughs> I mean, back then, I mean, it got to the point to where, you know, the guys would, you know, have a doctor come in and give us all B12 shots. Right. You know, okay. Yeah, yeah. You get tired out on yeah. the road, you know, when you're doing it for, you know, nine months out of the year, coming back, you know, being with your family for a few weeks and go in the studio, then you're back on the road again. I mean, it's just one continuous circle, you know, and it was that way for me for nine years. And, uh, one of the other bands that um, you guys toured with early on, I think it's 1981, was UFO. Yeah, UFO. Paul Chapman, man. Uh, yeah, Pete Way, those yeah. guys. Yeah. <clears throat> we toured with those fellows, and you know, it was it was it was good camaraderie, you know, because we being you know southern guys from Jacksonville, Florida, you know. You know, meeting up with these guys, you know, in England, you know, it was, it was fun. We played with them over in Europe quite a bit, you know, and, uh, those guys are nice. And there was a fellow by the name of Paul Chapman that, uh, um, uh, after, uh, I left Molly Hatchet back in 2004, 2005, another band was started by the original members of Molly Hatchet and, uh, Dwayne Rowland passed away. We got Paul Chapman to come in and, uh, finish the rest of the, t- the years of the tours that we had uh, under the name of Gator Country. And, 
Were you, were you on that tour too, Jug? Were you on that one? Oh, I was, they, the band wanted me to be their manager, not the road manager. So not mm-hmm. only was I out there physically, but I was, you know, it was a monetary thing, okay? You know, it takes a lot of money for a rock and roll band to get up and to, to rock. And, I mean, we're talking tens of hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know. And, you know, luckily at that time, uh, I, you know, had a little money put away and uh, knock on wood. And, uh, you know, I used up, you know, quite a bit of the money that I had that uh, for the tours. And, uh, you know, because I don't know what it is about the music business. I mean, you did, I did the, you know, hatchet for nine years and then I did some, um, I did some shows that uh, one of them was uh, jamming for D, uh, DJB, Danny Joe Brown. That's when Danny was really sick. And it was in 1999, and uh, it was done in Orlando, Florida. And we were at a venue and got all the you know original band members to come in and, and fly in. And, you know, with some other people that came in and played. And, uh, you know, it was just camaraderie of getting, you know, the guys back together in 1999 you know, years after, you know, basically everybody left. It just, uh, it was good. And then several years later, um, Bruce Crump uh, developed throat cancer. and We did a uh, concert for him up in uh, Virginia. But, you know, I also worked with them and then, you know, on that project. And then uh, actually with Gator, the band Gator Country, we could not use Molly Hatchet. No. But we advertised that, that Gator Country was the original era recording members of Molly Hatchet. And Gator Country had to be one, uh, 100% and Molly Hatchet had to be 30% in okay. the advertising. advertising. And we, we, we had to do it that way. You know, before we started, I flew to, uh, uh went to, uh, uh, Nashville, Tennessee. I met with a gentleman by the name of John Bider and, uh, he was, uh, entertainment uh, attorney and he met with me um for half a day told me what i could do what i couldn't do and uh he gave me the ins and outs what you know the parameters and we took it and we took off with it and uh in fact the very first show that we did was uh uh march the 10th in uh orlando florida at universal studios and what was left of Leonard skinner was playing across the park um so Skinner, you know, on one stage, and it was hat, you know, basically the guys from Hatchet, you know, uh, and it, it was just, you know, it was a fun show, and that la- that's another major string to your bow, um, Jug, because I didn't know, I didn't know you were uh, with Gator Country, I didn't know. Yeah, yeah, you know, I get a phone call, I get a phone call in 2004 from a friend of mine by the name of uh, Everett Leibold, who owns a sound and light company in Nashville. And uh, uh, Everett used to mix front of house for Molly Hatchet back in the day. And Everett, you know, we kept in contact. Everett calls me and says, hey, Keith, or he didn't say Keith. He said, hey, Jug. He said, this is Everett. Jimmy wants to put the band back together, and he's talked to everybody, and they're, you know, it's a go. They want to do it. And he's told me to call Jimmy Farrar because Jimmy, you know, actually put the fire under everybody's butts. You know, to uh, to do the Gator Country project, and uh, it just so happens that Danny Joe passed away two days before our show at Universal Studios, and uh, the following year, Dwayne died uh, at my house um, here in St. Augustine, Florida. Uh, uh, some circumstances happened with Dwayne; his wife passed away. He had to move from. Uh, Atlanta, Georgia area, and I just brought him down here to St. Augustine, and uh, I let him stay at my house, you know, for for years. And uh, uh, he, uh, you know, he passed away. I had a real job, you know, when I was also the manager for uh, Molly Hatchet, and uh, I had a real job, and uh, for 25 years. And uh, in fact, I just retired from six years ago. But uh, you know, it's just, you know, I came in from work one day, and you know. Dwayne liked to smoke cigarettes. I don't smoke cigarettes. I let him, you know, come come in my office and do it. And uh, and uh, I noticed there was no cigarettes in the ashtray. And uh, you know, I went it over to his room and I uh, found, you know, Dwayne had passed away. So I didn't know that either. So uh, uh, thanks for sharing that. Very very sorry. Um, Con- Con- 
kind of hits right here, my oh, friend. Oh, I can imagine. I can imagine. Um, I mean, all of them, all of them, you know. Of course, yeah. I mean, I had, a, I had a premonition that Banner, you know, had passed away, you know, and <clears throat> it just so happens I was on that side of Jacksonville, you know, and I went into this funeral home, you know, that the people from Skinner used this funeral home, and so Banner used the same funeral home, and I went in there and I said, you know, I told him who I was, and I said, you know, I had this funny feeling. Is there somebody in here that used to be with Molly Hatch? And they said, yes, it was Banner Thomas. Well, you know, a couple of years later, you know, the same thing happened with Bruce Crump. I'm living in St. Augustine. I was in downtown St. Augustine. Bruce's mom lived in St. Augustine, okay? And uh, at the time, Bruce was living in St. Augustine. And I just got a funny feeling something's wrong, something's wrong. Yeah. And once again... You know, I, I went to the same funeral home where uh, that took care of Dwayne. OK. And I asked them and they said, yes, Bruce Crump was brought in this morning. And, I, you know, I, I guess after spending all the, t- the your time with all these people, you learn and you get a feeling about, you know, what happens. I mean, I'm not trying to say I'm psychic or you're weird or blah, blah, blah. No, no, I understand. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just... You spend so much time together involved in each other's lives. There's something more than what we can see. It, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, you know, death is a funny thing, you know. It's, uh, it is. it is. And there's no going back. There's no, you know, second chances, you know. And none of us are going to walk out of here. No, you know? I mean, no, we're going to get carried out. But, you know, which is why, which is why I'm doing this show so that we can talk about things like this and remember these guys and that's why I you know why I came to first circle you know to talk yeah. about it yeah. you know yeah you know even though it's sad you know these guys you know came from nothing to you know bigger than dirt you know yeah. I mean yeah yeah at 79 you know 79 80 if Danny Joe would have stayed with Molly Hatchet you know for the you know for the third album for the fourth album for the fifth album yeah yeah you know, Molly Hatchet would be another Leonard Skinner let's Leonard say Skinner. you yeah. know or yeah. you know or another Almond Brothers band you know and it just uh, and it just so happens you know Garth that uh, I'm working with the Jacksonville Historical Society to bring a music museum of all memorabilia that I have the platinum albums and the uh, the posters that I have, you know, of Molly Hatch. And, uh, it, you know, you got people like that, like Pat Boone, the crooner, you know, the yep. singer. You know, yep. And you got people like Ray Charles, the Almond Brothers, 38 Special. 38 Ryan, Special, yep. You know, it just goes on and on and on, you know, and just, you know, 38 Special, you know, and, and, and who's the lead singer now of Leonard Skinner is Johnny Van Zandt. He had his own band called the Johnny Van Zandt Band, and they opened for us in the 80s. You yeah, know? yeah, so yeah. It's it just what goes around comes around. It goes around, around doesn't it? Know? Yeah. Uh, I, I, wanted, I want to let your listeners know, mm. okay, mm. that there is a website called The Original Molly Hatchet Group. Yep. And if you go to that, you have to join to get – to be a part of that group, okay? It's on Facebook. Well, Is that correct? Facebook? Yes, it's on yep. Facebook. Yep. Yep. The, the original Molly Hatchet group. Yep. And you log on to that. There's a word that says join. Yeah. It's a blue, it's blue highlighted jo- join. And you click onto that and you answer three question, history questions about Molly Hatchet. Okay. I'm not going to tell you the answers, but if the people want to come onto the website, they can always Google the answer and find out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've joined and on there, on there, before we finish up, they can get access to your videos. And that, that is my website. I yes. am the administrator. Yes. Okay. And I tell stories called uh, the gatekeeper of yes. things that happen out on the road from where I first started with the band until, you know, till the end of my time with the band. And right now I'm still in 1980, 81. So I've got, you know, five more years, six more years to talk about. It. Uh, people get, can go join that Facebook group. And on that Facebook group, in that Facebook group, you can see Jug's uh, series called the Gatekeeper series. And right. on that, he tells more stories than we will hear. Um, and it's professionally done. It's good videos. I've had a look uh, and you right. really like it. And I'll put, a, I'll put a link up here and so you can find it. 
uh, and you'll, you'll enjoy seeing uh, more than we can do here. G- just give us a bit of a taste of one of the stories that you tell on the Gatekeeper series, if you wouldn't mind. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, we're out with the Outlaws, okay? Great tour, end of, end of year tour, okay? And um, the Outlaws, before, while the Outlaws were playing, Molly Hatch had already played, okay? We were opening for the Outlaws. I'm on my way back to the dressing room. Well, the band and crew, they come up behind me, and they roll me up in duct tape. They carry me up to the stage, you know, like a worm, okay? And I'm on the stage where, while the outlaws, you know, are playing, and the outlaws are kicking me and rolling me around and stuff like that. You know, it was all in fun, you know. It was just, you know, it, it, you know, you, you have to. You know, you get bored out on the road, and it's, you know, you want something to do. But what happened after the outlaws came out, you know, into the backstage area, Molly Hatchett had gotten all the road cases of the uh, lighting and sound uh, road cases and also uh, Molly Hatchett uh, road cases for their equipment. They put in a half moon around the back of the backstage area coming out of of the stage. And, uh, I had gone with another member of the band and bought 100 cream pies. And <laughs> and when the outlaws came out, they didn't have their guitars with them, okay? When the outlaws came through that door, we bombarded them with, uh, with ch- chocolate cream, banana cream, key lime pie cream, you know, I mean, oh. and it, it I mean, a hundred pies, you know, backstage. Yeah. And what happened is Molly Hatchett got fined because we brought the pies, okay? Yeah. And the backstage area had to be cleaned yeah. of all these pies all around this half moon. Yeah. I mean, you got, uh, uh, you know, the Billy Jones of the Outlaws and Huey Thompson of the Outlaws and David Diggs of the Outlaws. You know, everybody's got pie all over them. And they're, <laughs> There's pictures in that episode of The Gatekeeper about the pie fight. And, uh, it, you know, it's just, uh, you know, it's just a fun thing to do. And these are, uh, not only are the episodes, you know, about the history of the band, but we also bring in people that are, had direct contra- contact with the band. And, uh, so I'm just, uh, you know, I, I, I just, I want the history to go on because yeah. I want the yeah. people to know about the original members yeah. of Molly. Yeah, I agree, and that's why that's why we're here. So I will encourage people to go there and see those videos, and um and I'll put a link up here to the group um in Facebook so people can find Thank it. You. Um, I wanted to tell you a story. Now I don't even know if I'll leave this in the recording jug, but I wanted to tell you um a story, a funny thing that happened to me and my band because you just reminded me. Um. We were playing in this uh, open air in a, in a sound shell, you know, and, and it was a sound shell stage but right. open air. There was about four or five bands, and um, <clears throat> uh, I, I can't remember if we were the last band or whatever, and um, we used to do like a 12-minute version of Wild Thing, you know. We'd just go on and on forever and do a seven-minute, you know, wah-wah solo. And when we were playing, we get up there and we're playing <clears throat> Wild Thing, uh, this guy jumps up onto the stage and he's in a full professional gorilla suit, right? And he starts doing the monkey dance, you know, and he's jumping around and it was as if I, and the crowd cheered and they thought it was part of the show. And we're playing and we're looking at each other and we're mouthing to each other, you know, who's this guy? Who, who's that? Like, who, who said, you know, we're mouthing it as we're playing along. Um, and, and this guy does a full monkey for about 15 minutes while we're playing as soon as the song was over, he ran out at the back of the crowd and disappeared, right? So when the show was over, the first thing we said to the um, uh, the promoter, the guy that was, you know, put the show on, we said, who was that and how did you know? And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, I don't know. He said, I have no idea. I said, come on, you, you, you set that up? And he said, no, I did not set that up. And to this day, none of us know who the person in the gorilla suit, but the timing was absolutely perfect, and the story is as true, true as I'm sitting here. And the promoter says, I have no idea. I said, come on, you set us up. Come on. He said, no. <laughs> That's incredible. That's a, What a story, you know. I mean, yeah. first, first of all, if they weren't with Molly Hatchett, if they didn't have, you know, the right pass, you know, yeah. show it on their body somewhere, yeah. they couldn't even get anywhere close yeah. to the stage. Yeah, well, the, the yeah. thing here, this was open air. It was only probably 1,200 people, and you could have right. just stepped up. Anyone could have stepped up, and, and he did. 
But the point about the story is that none of us knew, and to this day we don't know, but he was perfect timing. It was as if he was part of the show. The people were clapping their hands, thinking, oh, ha, ha, funny. And we're just looking at each other going, wow, man, who was that? And to this day, none of us know. <laughs> that's incredible. That's funny. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love, that's why I liked your story about the cream pies, man. I, and rolling you up. Oh. And rolling you up in the tape, man. <laughs> well, the, you know, it's just funny that, uh, you know, there's more story, you know, having to do, you know, for example, when Danny left the band, you know, and and the uh, scenario of, you know, went went on, you know, during those few months, yeah. you know, yeah. and it's just, uh, you know, it's a learning situation. You know, it's, you know, I, I guess I'm teaching history here, you know, yeah, yeah. so. Yeah, yeah, but. well, that's true. And it's for the, for a good cause. It's for a good reason. It's it's keeping the memories alive. And you know there are going to be young people. They're going to discover Molly Hatchet, and they're going to want to know, hey, the original Molly Hatchet. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm not going to say anything no, about no, the guys right. who are out there now. Um, I guess that they have a reason. You know, I don't know what it is, but uh, you know, the original era recording members of Molly Hatchet. Yeah. In my opinion was and is Molly Hatchet. Yeah, yeah, and I, I've gushed enough, I think, but that flirting with Disaster album was just... There won't be another... Uh, and I don't want to offend other Southern rock bands or, or fans, but it's just, it, it, to me, because it was just... It had everything... Um, every song is a, is a, is a gem. Uh, and, you know, there's only a few albums, well, there are more than a few, but there's only a few bands that can produce an album like that and you go, every song's a gem, you know? Every song's a gem. I was amazed. I'd never heard of Molly Hatchet before, okay, mm. until mm. I started working for him, okay? Yeah. Wow. I was introduced to Southern Rock, you know, when I was going to school in Gainesville, you know, it was uh, the uh, the Marshall Tucker Band. Yeah. You know, I yeah. like the Marshall Tucker Band, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and, and it just... You know, through the years, you know, and I'll be honest with you, Garth, you know, I don't really like much music out there anymore mm. because I've listened to Molly Hatchet, you know, so many times that, you know, I could probably get up there and do a show, but yeah. my voice <laughs> sucks, you know, yeah. so. Uh, yeah. And, and I'm, not, I'm not as pretty as Danny Joe Brown. No, so, uh, no, no. He's a good looking bloke. Do you miss those days? Not just on the road, but with the band and those fun things and the camaraderie. Yeah. Do you miss it? Yeah, I miss my friends. Yeah. I miss my friends. Yeah. Uh, it, it was like Dwayne and I, you mm. know. Um, mm. Dwayne and I got to be really close. Uh, Steve and I at one time, you know, during Gator Country got real close. Jimmy Farrar and I were really close. Yeah. You know, mm. Riff and I were pretty close, you know. Yeah. Uh, Bruce, you know. We were close, but not as close as I was to these other guys, you know. And you know, it just uh, it's uh, it's you know, I guess there's a reason, or you know, for what happened or what has happened, and none of us know what the answer. Would you, if you, if you could go back again, and they said to you, "Hey, we want you to road manage this band," would you do it again? At that age? Yeah. Yes. At that age. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At that age, yes. But yeah. it's 70 years old, almost 71 years old. Um, I, uh, I, no, no. First of all, my body can't take it. Uh, I mean, I'm doing this, you know, interview at five o'clock in the morning. Yeah. You know? I, yeah. I don't know if you're recording this for, you know, or still, but, yeah, I uh, am, yeah. You know, I usually don't go to bed till like 10 or 11 o'clock at night, but I'm up like at 4, 4.30 in the, you know, morning, you know, right. because on the website, uh, the original, the original Bali Hatchet group, yeah. I, uh, I go on being the administrator every morning and I, you know, give my thought of the day, you know, and it's some thought that I see on the internet that I thought might be, you know. I saw that today, the positive ones. I think I clicked oh, on it. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah, I saw that today, yeah. I think we might we might leave it there, and I'm going to point people to um, the Gatekeeper series so they can learn more. Um, so we'll just. All right. Well, uh, you I want to, you. You want to finish on a? Do you, you got a few thoughts you want to finish on? Well, I'd just like to say thank you, Garth, for giving me time to 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 you know the people you know down under you know I mean, 
never got to go to Australia or New Zealand or Tasmania, you know, but if I had the money and the time, I would have loved to have gone, you know, um, but, you know, I just appreciate you giving me the opportunity to speak to your people, you know, your family. And then, you know, we struggled a bit to get a date because of the time zones and all those things. So I guess what I'm leading up to is I just um, I'm very honoured that you've come on uh, and I just appreciate you giving me your time. And um, I just wish you all the best. And um, I will definitely point people to, you know, the Gatekeeper series because it's well worth watching. Awesome. Thank you very much, Jack. Thank you so much. Cheers. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I'm very grateful to Keith for his time and for the stories he shared with us. Don't forget to join his Facebook group, the Original Molly Hatchet Group, and also consider liking and subscribing to my channel here on YouTube. The channel is called Philosopher Rock, and this show is a sub-show called 4550 RPM, Remembering Past Musos. All right, well, that's it for now. Until next time, I'm your host, GK. Take care of yourself. Mm -hmm.